Hello and welcome to Planet Critical, a podcast for a world in crisis. My name is Rachel Donald. I'm an investigative journalist and your host. Every week I interview experts who are battling to save our planet. My guests are economists, scientists, politicians, academics and activists. They explain the complexities of the energy, economic and ecological crises that we face today. And they reveal their solutions to mitigate the damage to our future. This is a critical time for our planet. It demands critical thinking. Click the subscribe button now and go to planetcritical.com to learn more. This week's guest is Dan Fiskus. Dan was an engineer who retrained in ecology. He's written a book along with Brian Fath, Foundations for Sustainability, a Coherent Framework of Life-Environment Relations. And essentially, this book and what he came on the show to discuss is about how the current paradigm of science and scientific research as being value-neutral is one of the driving forces behind the climate crisis. Dan says that science cannot be used to address the problems that we face and investigate the solutions that we require without infusing ethics and values into science itself. He describes science as ROME, which is an acronym for reductionist, objectivist, analytical, and mechanistic. And he goes into great detail about what the acronym means, uh, how it influences research, how it influences what scientists prioritize, and what the field of science itself investigates. And he proposes a new paradigm called WHOLE, Holistic Organic Life Science. Essentially, Dan's argument is, how do we concretize the relationship between life and environment as essential? And how do we reframe science as a means to honor and encourage that relationship? This is a really fascinating discussion, especially following on from last week's episode with Carl Safina, in which he discussed how Western philosophy, the paradigm of philosophy, has driven the climate crisis. So I think you'll all get a lot out of this. I know I certainly did. If you do get a lot out of the episode, please share it far and wide. If you love it, do consider supporting Planet Critical on Patreon, where you'll find public bonus episodes of my thoughts on each interview. The Patreon link is in the description box below, and thanks to everyone who's already supporting the project. Dan, I'm thrilled to have you on the show because I read through your PDF about how the conventional science paradigm is partly responsible or a driving force in the ecological crisis. And just the week before, I spoke with Carl Safina about how Western philosophy has also driven the consumer culture, which he sees as hugely responsible for the ecological crisis as well. So it's brilliant to get your perspective on this because I just think these two interviews back to back um, will be really, really enlightening for listeners and for myself, of course. That's really neat to hear. I'll have to uh, listen to your other uh, interview. I'm also really excited to talk about this because I think it fits in with the themes of Planet Critical and your mission. So I'm looking forward to it. Brilliant. So, I mean, you know, let, let's get into it. Let's talk about Rome science. It's, um, I've got it written down here, reductionist, objectivist, analytical, mechanistic science. How is that driving uh, the climate crisis? So in order to start answering that, my co-author, Brian Fath, uh, we wrote a book in 2018 called Foundations for Sustainability. And that's basically what we said, but in order to, to you know, set the stage or tell a little bit of the story of how we got there, it's probably important to understand that I'm an ecologist. So that's how I came up uh, through science and through education, pretty much forms my approach to everything, you know, to nature, how the world works, uh, an ecological perspective. And then the other part of what got me to that paradigm idea is that I've been spending probably 25 years thinking about what it is that's causing the global ecological crisis. And I've been really trying to dig into that and, and understand it and find the root cause because I'm really motivated to help find a solution. When I talk about global ecological crisis, I'm talking about many major environmental crises that we're facing right now all at the same time, right? So. A lot of times climate disruption takes top billing as the main crisis, but there's also species extinction, nitrogen cycle disruption, water quality and quantity, toxins and pollution like microplastics. It's a huge and life-threatening list. And those are only the environmental crises. We also have social and economic ones as well. 
So a lot of times if somebody's, you know, confronted with something like this, the, the basic approach is to break it apart into smaller pieces, right? It's kind of a standard strategy. It even seems like common sense. Let's break this down. But as an ecologist, that's not necessarily how we think. You kind of take the opposite approach. So instead of breaking it apart, I've been looking at what connects all of these sub-crises into a single systemic crisis. So the, the sub-crises, even like climate change and, and energy crisis and food crisis, those are symptoms on the surface of this much deeper underlying disorder. And I know you've talked with other folks who kind of look at the same way, said the same thing, similar holistic approach. So when I started trying to figure that out, like what is it that would cause this crisis? I just kept asking why, why and why and why, kind of like a kid just trying to get down to the bottom of it. So the first part of it is it seems to be linked to industrial culture, right? We know that indigenous cultures are not causing the global ecological crisis, okay? But what is it about industrial culture? Well, it seems to be connected to the technology. You know, that's kind of the power of what's going on, changing the world. But why? What is it about industrial technology? And there is where you get to, you know, the idea that it's about the science. The science is driving the technology, which is driving the industrial culture, which is causing this crisis. And the answer to that question of why, what is it about the science specifically, that's what we wrote the book about. And that's what you started asking about. You know, it ends up pointing to reductionist, objectivist, analytical, mechanistic science. You know, the acronym is ROME. It's basically the dominant mainstream paradigm of science we've had for the past 400 so years, you know, since uh, Descartes and Newton and folks like that. Could we break... <laughs> break down, despite what you just said. But just quickly, could you explain how science can be reductionist and then objectivist, then analytical and then mechanistic? Yes, I, I'll do that while also saying the three main foundational concepts of this uh, mainstream science that are causing the global ecological crisis, okay? So the first one is kind of connected to the O of, of Rome, the objectivity part. The current science we have you can hear folks say it over and over again, science has to be objective, right? It has to be value neutral. Well, that lack of any kind of value basis is a great weakness. So science as it is now is ungrounded. So it allows science to be used for harmful things. The other part of that analysis and reduction that's causing a problem is conventional science splits everything apart, splits things into smaller fundamental particles all the way down. And the biggest mistake here that we point out in the book is splitting life apart from the environment. Treating life and environment as if they're two categorically different things. It's another analytical reductionist step. And the, the last one about mechanism, so that's this root metaphor in science where everything is treated as if the sort of fundamental unit of how the world works is a mechanism. Okay, hang on. Let, let's stop there before we get into number three, because I read number three and I was really, really interested um, and I needed a, a little bit of explication on it. So before we go there, let me ask you, um, we say that science is objective and it's value neutral. Does science itself have to be infused with ethics or could it not be that scientists have to be infused with ethics? Like, why is it important for the paradigm of science in itself to have a value system? It's a great question, and don't know if I have a, a real good answer, but what I can say is that in this whole story, which is hard to tell, you know, a sort of a one pass through linear story, if we end up saying that science, the way it is now, because of its paradigm, is causing the global ecological crisis, we're trying to fix that. The ultimate goal is solve the global ecological crisis, right? We got to stop this train wreck. We're going off this cliff. We got to do something. And the antidote or the, the, the revised paradigm would be to have a specific value basis. That would mean science in service to life. And because we argue or we're, we're saying, and we borrow this from many other people, like Aldo Leopold said the same thing, right? Uh, he's uh, famous for the Sand County Almanac and the land ethic and the, and the 
uh, 40s in the U.S., he said, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. So I know what you're saying, that there's the difference between science and scientists, but unless science itself is oriented explicitly to be in service to life, then it's basically wrong. You know, by, by this kind of very strong assertive ethics, which values life, and so it's going to value life support, it's going to value the environment. If you don't start at the beginning with that grounding in ethics, pretty much from step one, you're off track. You're just not acting in service to life. So that's not a very good answer, but it's a great question. It, it, it is a good answer, and it makes me think that um, given the objectivist value neutral, you know, approach to science that another way, another terminology for it would be changing the goal of science as well, so that it is um, supportive of the biota, supportive of life at all times rather than, and this is a term that came up last week, but the pursuit of knowledge at all costs. And it was actually Carl last week who said, um, we shouldn't even ever really be using that phrase because the pursuit of knowledge is separate from the pursuit of knowledge at all costs. Nothing should ever be at all costs. Knowledge should never be at all costs. It has to be in support of whatever the original objective was, really. Yeah, yeah, that's that's another way to say it. Something I probably should have said at the beginning, when I'm kind of critiquing science, I'm not anti-science. Of course not. You know, neither me or Brian or the book or any of this work is, is anti-science. The first part of the story is showing science as the cause of the problem, but the second part is showing science as the solution. Right. And so science in service to what? That's the question. You know, science is a good thing, but in service to what? And if we don't, you know, keep life going, if we don't sustain life, then nothing can continue. I mean, there's no science, there's no art, there's no culture, there's nothing. So that's the other reason we start with that. It's, it's kind of amazing that we even have to say that, but our culture is so far down a strange path that we've sort of forgotten some of the most basic things about reality. Absolutely. Um, so a lot of my uh, journalistic work is looking into um, illegal logging in the Pacific and Southeast Asia. And that I think is such, because I was going to ask you, what's a really good example of separating life from the environment? And to me, that's actually the first thing to answer my own question. <laughs> it's the first thing that comes to mind. Um, that to think that we can raise whole habitats, whole forests, um, as if the loss of that environment will not have some impact on life, as if life is some kind of um, sci-fi test tube thing that can continue to live in a void without the very thing that nourishes it. Yeah, so that's a big and stark and uh, sadly, you know, happening all over the place example that you just cited. But there are some that are even uh, much more close at hand and very simple. One of the little thought experiments that I, I use to try to help people understand that we're completely interdependent with all life, we're interdependent with ecosystems and the biosphere, is I just say, you know, if you want to test the idea that you're an independent entity, hold your breath. Right, you get about four minutes if you're pretty good. You know, maybe if you're a swimmer, you might get six or eight. You get a, a handful of minutes being disconnected from green plants before you either die or pass out. It's every single breath. And the fact that we've forgotten this, and again, industrial cultures have, I mean, uh, indigenous people have not forgotten this. Mm -hmm. We, for some reason, have forgotten and we have to get it back. But you know what's so interesting? It's like that reductionist perspective because when you said hold your breath, I'm like, yes, of course, because we need oxygen. And I'd almost forgotten the, 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 the other, the step further back, which is that oxygen comes from the green plants. You know, I even failed at that point, despite having all of these conversations to see it as that relationship between plant life and uh, humankind. Like oxygen doesn't come from bloody no it also doesn't come out of the void <laughs> yeah, yeah i mean that's i'm the same way you know and it's why things like you know meditation and focusing on your breath have multiple kinds of power you know the mindfulness 
is good for your mind. It's also good for connecting to the larger context of life that we live in. It's also, to me, kind of a miracle. You know, the fact that we have an oxygen atmosphere on this planet was created by life in concert with the planet. Uh, there's no other planet that has that. And, and that's not the only way in which life is different than a machine. So the fact that soils grow spontaneously, they grow in depth and fertility, that's another example of how life knows to improve its environment as it operates. Mm. And that's the opposite of what a machine does. Machines degrade their environment as they operate. They're, they're inherently entropy producing. So they generate waste. They generate waste energy, lower quality energy, emissions, toxic uh, gases, all kinds of things. That's why we suggest switching, you know, the core root metaphor. Instead of focusing on machines and mechanisms, we need to use more of a life-based metaphor for how the world works. I um, wrote a sentence from uh, the summary that you sent me, and it said, life as mechanism produces... Oh, no, wait. No, hang on. I summarized a sentence and I've summarized it badly upon rereading. Um, seeing life as a mechanism creates a sense of reality or normalizes systems that are entropy producing and environment degrading. Um, and you said that mechanism has been reified. Let, let's get a little bit further into that because I know I kind of took us off on a little tangent there. I'm always on these tangents. It's not a. It's not an easier <laughs> linear thing to talk about. It's sort of like a messy, hyper-connected um, uh, set of ideas. But one way to talk about that, or to think about the part of how it's it's become reified. So maybe back when you know Descartes and Newton were starting up this idea of looking at a mechanistic approach to the world, it might have started as a kind of. Uh, sort of innocent uh, thing like, let's say just for discussion purposes, let's assume that an organism acts like a machine. Okay, so it might have started like that, but now, after 400 years of all the sort of success stories of what that approach has gotten for us, all the technology we have, you know, all the uh, space travel and everything else we have, medicine, you know, many positive developments, it has now become more of a way that we think rather mm. than a thing that we, you know, are consciously aware that we're thinking. So if you, if you pay attention to uh, a lot of uh, writing, and it could be science writing or it could just be uh, journalism, if, listen to when people use the word mechanism, okay? People will talk about the mechanism of this or that, or there's no mechanism, you know, to incentivize this or that. That is a way of treating the world as if it's a mechanical thing. And people have forgotten that, that that's just a metaphor. They actually think it's mechanistic. And the way you can see that they do that is they focus on things like, well, let's just break it apart, or let's tweak it, or let's you know change the efficiency, or let's look at the inputs. But it, it's really true that organisms are treated like mechanisms, so we can swap out parts, and the real way that it becomes profound or scaled up to the, to, to the global ecological crisis is that we've turned the world into a machine. The world is very literally running out of gas, breaking down, wearing out and falling apart, creating entropy like a machine. And we know that that's not normal in terms of life, because we were just talking about what does life do? It maintains an oxygen atmosphere, it's stabilized climate, it handles waste through soil and, and recycling, uh, naturally heals itself, uh, flourishes with biodiversity. It's nothing like a machine. So the actions of over 400 years, every school kid learning about the way the world works then millions and billions of daily actions have turned the world into the machine that conventional science has modeled it to be. Mm -hmm. I am. Um, a few years ago, I was working on this, like, God, I can't believe I'm saying this out loud, but like a, a philosophical thesis that I envisioned one day would, would be a PhD. 
And I toyed around with the idea and wrote a couple chapters and then left it. But it was essentially playing with the idea that um, we quite literally live within a matrix of thought because of the generations uh, based upon assumptions or presumptions or perceptions of how the world works and then basing one's research um, upon that starting block and as the generations go by continuing in this kind of increasingly narrowing perception ultimately creates a false reality um, in which we have no idea how to engage with the, re the actual reality. We cannot fix the reality because we live within this perception of our own making. And when I lived in France, I taught at universities and I had a couple, a couple of um, classes of science students. And my favorite thing to do about halfway through the year, once they'd gotten used to me, was have a debate and say, okay, science is an ideology. Discuss. And they would say, no, 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 it's not an ideology. You can't say that. It's empirical and it's, you know, measured and it's da-da-da-da-da. And I would say, yeah, sure. Like, yes, if you can do the same thing over and over again, there is an element of like, yes, that is objective. The, the same thing will come to pass. So you're abiding by whatever laws of physics or whatever. But there is an inherent assumption that all of the research that has come before that has been accepted by the institutions in the academy is correct. And you are basing your own research as you go forward because there's no way you can go back 400 years to verify the previous assumptions and presumptions upon which the scientific method has been built. So there is an ideological um, drive there that you, you have to ascribe to in order to continue within that paradigm, right? Uh, yes, totally. I don't know if you during that stuff that you were just talking about, if you ever saw uh, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions by Thomas Kuhn. No. Writing it down. I think he coined the term paradigm shift. His book came out in the early 60s, but it's very similar to what you were just talking about. So he, he was kind of a historian, historian of science. He showed that science is very much a social process. And he showed how you could look at the major revolutions in science and they had a recurring pattern. There was this pattern where, uh, you know, and the main ones he talks about are like uh, the Copernican uh, paradigm of the sun in the center of the solar system instead of the one before that where the Ptolemaic uh, model was that the earth was in the center. Yeah. So you go through this period where everybody believes the old paradigm, it's fine, it works for what we need to do. And then you start getting, you know, annoying uh, observations that don't fit anymore. And these build up and then there's a crisis. You know, there's a crisis within astronomy in that case. And then somebody else comes up with a new model and it flips to a new paradigm. Well, it was the same way with uh, the oxygen theory of combustion. That was a crisis in chemistry. And then there was uh, the physics crisis that led to relativity. But part of what I uh, said in that recent article that I sent you is that I think part of the problem right now, one of many reasons, sources of confusion, is that because science, technology, and culture are so completely integrated, the crisis is not arising in science. The crisis is arising in the environment. And so whereas right now, nobody's really looking at this as a crisis for science. So when people say, like maybe those students that you were talking with would say, you know, science is good. Science is all good. Well, if you're living right through a paradigm shift, it depends on what kind of science you're talking about. Right? If you're talking about the old paradigm of science, that may not be so good. I think unless we start to realize that the, the crisis symptoms now are not just in one field, right? The ones I talked about that Kuhn said were in chemistry, in astronomy, in physics. Right now, the crisis is happening to us uh, because of the planetary climate crisis, the pollution crisis, the um, species extinctions. And you'd have to percolate all the way back through culture, through technology, and then get back to science to uh, kind of understand the story that I'm, you know, Brian and I put together in this book. Um, but it, it still seems like the same pattern. There's a crisis now. Science needs to change. 
because the old paradigm isn't working. When people say we need to follow the scientists, some of the best environmental activists and some of the greatest leaders are saying, just, you know, follow the science. And I, I would just come on and say, wait a minute, you know, all science is not created equal. If you're, if you're really motivated to, to fix the climate crisis, for example, but your solution is more machines and, you know, maybe even market-based mechanisms, it's not going to be part of the solution. That's what got us into this crisis. Yeah, yeah. This is this is so interesting for me because, you know, all of you experts that I'm speaking to, what's brilliant is that, you know, everybody really firmly um, states how their area of expertise has engendered either a part of or, um, yeah, a part of the crisis. Uh, which I noticed you called the meta crisis. So it is essentially that all of these different um, paradigms, whether it's, you know, neoliberal economics, uh, whether it's, um, you know, yes, Rome science, um, whether it's the commodification culture, et cetera. Um, all roads are kind of leading to Rome right now where we're just, we're running out of space to continue fulfilling that reality. And all of you are also talking about the fact that essentially we need to be walking across corridors and knocking on the doors of our colleagues and saying, hey, I know nothing about what you do, but I think that we all need to work together to find some kind of solution because ultimately the solution is not going to come from one department on a, on a campus. I think that's a really, really good metaphor. And yet, and yet, as you said, everybody is turning towards science because it is that one thing that doesn't seem to be tainted, I want to say, with um, opinion. And certainly when you're coming out of a previously religious culture and science is the other uh, side of that coin, the other binary, it's, how do I put this? There's something appealing about a claim to objectivity in a time of crisis. But if it's that very perception of objectivity that is <laughs> driving the crisis, I mean, then, then, then what do we do? Yeah, it, it's... It's very uh, challenging. It's kind of like trying to look at your own eyeball, you know. Ah. It's, it's, um, <laughs> it's become so uh, part of culture and also the way we think, our language, everything, that it's hard to step outside of it. I um, grew up in uh, the mountains of western Maryland. It's an Appalachian part of Maryland, not too far from Washington, D.C., and you know, probably before I got into science, I fell in love with nature. I fell in love with forests and streams and mountains. And so that was kind of my first source of awe and reverence. And, and I was impressed by that. I then, you know, went into electrical engineering and later got into ecology. And I realized that as great as, as a lot of science is, it can't really touch what life can do. It's, it's, it's powerful, but needs to figure this next thing out. And um, one other thing I wanted to mention is that a lot of the inspiration for taking this approach came from Donella Meadows. She was a really amazing uh, systems modeler She's probably most famous for having been the lead author on the book Limits to Growth um, around, I think, 1970 or 72, A Club of God, Rome. God, that early on. Wow. Yeah. So she worked in understanding complex systems for her whole um, work life. And one of the things she, one time she wrote a paper where she had the top 12 sources of leverage for changing a complex system. And the, the number two and number one sources of leverage were the paradigm. And she said that's where a system kind of grows from. That's where all of its rules come out. That's where all of its uh, sort of incentives, all of the things that are taken uh, as allowed and, and treated as the values and the goals, they all come from the paradigm. So to number two, Second to the top source of leverage is the paradigm out of which the system arises. Number one is the power to transcend paradigms. So she was kind of saying, even if you get attached to your own favorite paradigm, 
it's more powerful if you can let go of it. So that fits with what you were saying with people, you know, trying to work uh, collaboratively, interdisciplinarily. I think she she really understood that that you know if my paradigm is about service to life and the importance of, of, of protecting life and valuing life, I may have to hold that lightly if I want to talk to somebody else, you know, and not just uh, project that onto them or say there's only one paradigm. And, you know, out here in the rural part of Maryland where I live, there's a lot of uh, really conservative folks. And these are folks politically conservative, you know, that I grew up with my whole life. And when I was writing that book and thinking about Donella Meadows' number one source of leverage, I started to think, you know, maybe there's a reason that these folks that I know are climate deniers, right? They, they, they don't believe in that. They don't agree with it. They won't talk about it. And I tried to think, you know, it's almost as if we're on two different planets. I can't even talk to them. And I, then I kept thinking, well, these are good people. I know these people. So what's going on here? And I came up with an other paradigm that, that I refer to as this other culture. Um, it's a hypothetical type of culture. We use just for discussion and thinking about this. But I thought maybe these folks see the same evidence that we're talking about, the same evidence of, you know, um, running out of uh, natural resources, causing damage. But when they get evidence of those limits, their approach is to transcend those limits. And their approach is to innovate their way out of it. And their approach is to find, you know, a solution, to, you know, to get beyond that limitation. The sustainer folks that I'm mostly speaking from, and the ones I think we need to follow to, to, you know, heal the earth, see the limits that are coming up, and they decide, oh, those are real limits. Those are hard limits. We have to change ourselves to fit and live within those limits. So, in the book, um, in a little bit, in that uh, new article I sent you, I try to say. There's value in this reductionist, analytical, objectivist, mechanistic science. But the main value is for transcending the limits of things, environments like the Earth. The main value and the place where that science is the only way to lead is space exploration. <laughs> yeah it's it sounds weird but you know some of my professors along the way when i've been saying the same thing for 20 years they kind of pat me on the back and say well we can't go back to the horse and buggy days you know and in this idea that that there is a place for mechanistic science helps with that right? We don't have to just go back. We are going to have to go back to sustainable ways. But the folks that want to transcend limits don't have to go back. We do have to find a way to work together. But I really think that space exploration is uh, something that you see inherent in, in life through all time and in human cultures. There's always been an urge to, to disperse migrate, travel, explore, um, you know, all plants do that. Their seeds have elaborate ways to fly away or float away to go to a new environment. Um, you know, people manage to get from remote islands to, you know, to get to Hawaii. And then uh, folks that got to North America walked from, you know, some other place during the um, last interglacial period. Another part of the story is that we don't have to only reject that. We just have to see where it's appropriate in terms of an environmental relationship. I, uh, I agree abstractly because I think that it's really important to stop seeing things as binary op opposites. Um, and I think that ultimately, like the, the climate crisis needs some, some really good marketing um, to get people on board more 
um, to stop saying, um, you know, essentially you're going to lose your entire way of life and start talking about how a post-carbon world could be better. Um, start talking about focusing on communities. And yes, there will be people hugely um, like, you know, obviously the first one that comes to mind is Musk, Elon Musk, um, who do feel an impetus, a drive um, to go off exploring. I was laughing because um, <laughs> I think for so many of us, it's like, yeah, they, they can all get in a spaceship and just go away. That That's fine. <laughs> let, let them have their space travel. Um, but then the question that would come up, and you brought this up in the in the paper, is you know the allocation of resources. Um, how much do you give to people to fund essentially their need for more? That's one. That's my value judgment of it. Um, whilst the rest of the resources are going to those who are trying to sustain and trying to celebrate and respect life, um, and surely those who are driving for more or for exploration will inevitably get their hands on more resources because i mean that's essentially like the funnel of human nature isn't it that there's 20 percent on the top 80 percent on the bottom that's how capitalism becomes neoliberal um it's how uh feudal villages ended up become with kings and queens and nations you know um my concern would be that the transcenders would want too much eventually yeah i mean those are all great points um and when i uh, kind of like you were saying about uh we have to work together it's not going to be from one discipline so uh some of the folks that i work with in in this group rare research alliance for regenerative economics uh, the founder of that group sally garner she focuses exactly on oligarchic capitalism so i i totally agree with you that that's got to be part of this system of solutions that we're going to put together um because i'm an ecologist and i think mostly in terms of the relationship between life and its environment i don't worry as much i mean i totally agree that it's not fair to have these extremes of, of uh, wealth and power. That's, that's crazy. One way that these, these uh, I think maybe say the, the more true space folks like NASA and other European space agencies that work on this, not the billionaires, right? Is that they know, right? They've planned, if you're gonna do a mission somewhere, you're gonna have to understand how to sustain life and this is the kind of the the kind of cosmic sort of irony or or uh, or yin yang of this, right? Is that even if they want to transcend Earth, they're going to basically have to take a mini Earth with them, and they're not going to succeed unless they understand how to sustain life in any environment. Um, so that's where I think eventually, if if we could uh, look at the perspective of life as the main value we could realize we have to work together. And it would bring up new questions like, yeah, well, if those people are really doing space exploration in service to life, maybe they should pause that mission for 50 years until we figure out Spaceship Earth. Then we can go back to transcender projects. Um, or like you said, allocation of resources, you know, uh, if if we're going to realize that that the the thing that unites us all and that we need to have as our fundamental value basis is life, then that puts us all on equal footing. We're all in the same boat. Everyone, it's like one person, one vote kind of a reality. I mean, it even includes non-humans, you know, are essential to our life support. Um, so I think some of the one things that are happening, you know, with uh, with the billionaires are are sort of distractions, or they're sort of um, a, a sideshow from th the other groups that are really committed to this, right? That 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 are have been in it for the long term, and they're doing it in a sort of holistic way. But you know, you're raising imp important challenges that we'd have to uh, deal with if this is going to go anywhere. 
<laughs> well, I mean, of course, the, the whole point of this meta crisis, and I'm saying it again because it's a term that I first have seen in your paper and I just love it. Um, the meta crisis, the big mess is that um, solutions are going to bring different problems and it's going to demand extremely creative and lateral thinking. Um, and ultimately creativity and compromise and all of these things that we perceive to be separate from one another, but ultimately can, of course, and must uh, be used together to find ways through the mess. Um, and on that, the paradigm, I believe, that you propose is whole, holistic, organic life science. Can you explain that a little bit? Uh, yeah, so that is a paradigm that we put together in the book. And what we tried to do basically was just replace each of those first three uh, pillars of conventional mechanistic science that I talked about, replace them with, with better ones. So let, let's just recap them quickly. So it's the first is science without values and ethics. The second is a conbiotic uh, way of looking at things, i.e. that life and environment are separable. And then finally, uh, life as a mechanism. So these are the three that you're proposing to replace. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So instead of uh, being value neutral and, and elevating objectivity to a sort of prime principle, we say that we have to focus on life as the, the value basis of science. And we need to invent a paradigm that is science in service to life. And when we talk about that, we use a capital L for life. So this is life itself. Life is a unified whole, um, not just life of organisms or individuals, but life in the organism, ecosystem, and biosphere all as integrated. Um, and then instead of the splitting and reducing, um, the analytical part, we um, say that we need to be synthetic and holistic. So focus on how things connect and are interdependent. Um, and again, the main one is that life and environment are interdependent. They're not separate. And we can see this uh, when you uh, use that as a founding pillar, you realize that life knows how to improve its environment as it operates. And another part that we talk about in the book is that life sort of uses the two main tendencies of physics, which are the sort of um, uh, dissipative breaking down of things, the sort of entropic part, and then the the, uh, the putting together and the assembly and the self-organizing part. Those, those have to be uh, integrated together. It's not just all one or the other. And then the last one was the life metaphor instead of the mechanism metaphor. So it's a little hard to to uh, to describe it that way. In that article I sent you, there's charts. Sometimes I try to put this on a piece of paper, and you can see all the the component pieces of each of the paradigm. Um, there are a bunch of others that are kind of interesting. Like we we had to define two different kinds of life, two different models of life. We talk about discrete life, the discrete life of an organism or an individual, and sustained life, which is the, um, the whole ecosystemic and biospheric part of life. And that borrows from physics, where you have particles and waves. So just as in the, the model, physical uh, models of light, you have these two uh, complementary incommensurable models for life, we did the same thing. So a discrete life form like, like an individual is either alive or dead. You, you, you know, you have a short uh, lifespan. Sustained life always includes both living and dead parts, like soils are somewhere in between. Soils are, are neither alive or dead. And the, the life of the whole has been going for four and a half billion years and, uh, you know, doesn't have that discrete ending point. Um, so uh, that's just a little, uh, you know, pitch that uh, those diagrams, I sometimes fall back on them. I know we can't look at them right now, but but they're in that paper at the end. <laughs> it's, it's interesting, you know, because obviously the first thing that comes to mind um, 
is, you know, that discrete life is the individual. Um, and God, how do you start to unpick that in an individualist culture, which is the Western culture, which has been exported pretty much all over the world? Um, how, and then how do you unpick our economics from that? And then how do you unpick our social organizing from that? And I mean, these things all do need to be unpicked, not just because of the ecological crisis, but because of the mental health crisis and because of the growing inequity and inequality crisis and because of human abuses and all of these kinds of things, you know, like um, some form of um, restructuring the value system is inherently necessary. But when it is perceived as an attack on um, the self, capital T, capital S. Oh, I mean, if a crisis won't do it, <laughs> what will? <laughs> yeah, well, again, you're hitting the the core crux uh, challenges. Um, I think that the way I said it, it might have sounded a bit more uh, confrontational or extreme, but I, I do think that a lot of folks, maybe most folks, do have a sense of of connection and importance to something outside the self, you know, whether it's like service to to God or, or a sense of uh, religion or whether it's your family or whether it's your country or whether it's your field, your professional field or mm -hmm. um, a lot. It's pretty common to plan for your children, what they might need in the future. Or if you have grandkids, I have uh, two granddaughters, you know, you, you, you think about their life, right? You, you do things because you're motivated to think about somebody else's life. So I know we are really entrenched in that thing you said about the culture, and but I don't think it's that far away if we want to stretch, you know, if we want to stretch and think in terms of, um, you know, again, like the grandkids, if, if, if I want them to be able to breathe clean air, I'm going to have to think about my own self, sense of self and how I live in this world because they're connected. Oh, that's interesting. Looking, looking at your own eyeball, look at thinking about your grandchildren, but refocusing that as a question of how does this self engage with the present and my environment and what can I do better? That's a good that's a really good marketing thing for the climate crisis for anybody that is an individualist. It's still about you. <laughs> I had another question. Yes. So my, my final question on this would be, how do you think the science, how is the scientific community reacting to your research and your proposition? And what do you think any pushback would be from scientists? Well, uh, it's actually a kind of, crazy winding twisting story which i couldn't tell all of the interesting milestones on but let me just say that um it uh hasn't been received very well um now i think we uh partly because of uh the work of brian fath he has done an amazing job he's the co-author of that book of uh, bridging into mainstream science. So he teaches at uh, Towson University and he's used our book to teach classes. Um, I got enough into this that I pointed out that it seemed like we, sh we should do a self-examination and that we might need a paradigm shift and that we even needed to change our own operations. The science needed to run on renewable energy, recycling materials, and stop degrading the environment. And um, people kind of got, uh, they accused me of being political or not being scientific. So I, I may not have said it well, I, um, but I, I do think more and more people are looking at this. And in fact, my, um, my PhD advisor, uh, Robert Yolanowitz, is also uh, doing great work to extend this. Um, he calls it the ecological metaphysic. And he's kind of invented that and, and also process ecology. And he's promoting it as basically um, a new paradigm of science. 
So people like Brian and Bob, they're the ones who are really carrying, you know, the, the development of the new paradigm uh, into the mainstream academic science. And are there students responding well to it? Because I could imagine, especially for Gen Z, I mean, they are all over value systems and reorganizing. I could imagine them jumping on the idea of a paradigm shift. Yeah, and again, I think it's more uh, uh, Bob and Brian who have connected to those students. Uh, Brian has taught our book in graduate seminars and he gets great comments and questions and people do really, really like it and respond to it. Um, and Bob had a, a teenager who turned one of his sets of his work into a graphic novel. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So she turned it into an animated way. And he, uh, he works in ecological networks. It's kind of like food webs, the way everything is connected through feeding relationships. That's how he got to a new paradigm of science was by realizing that, that um, all life is connected through networks. And he had to come up with new math to study that. So there are mostly through those two, because they're working more with students and more with academic circles. Uh, I think you're right that young people hopefully will like this. Could you, is the novel, is the graphic novel online? Is there any way I can link the episodes to that in some way? I'll have to ask uh, Bob and then the, the young woman who created it about that, but I yeah. can get back to you on that. Well, I mean, if there's some way I can drive, you know, some traffic to her, that would, that would be wonderful. I appreciate that. And I, I think it's, it's, it's important because it's, it gets to a different uh, age group. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Now, Dan, my final question for you then is who would you like to platform? Well, um, of the three folks that I work with in uh, RARE, Research Alliance for Regenerative Economics, uh, I already mentioned Sally Garner is the founder, Brian Pfaff, I wrote the book with, but Bob Ulanowitz, um has been my main sort of mentor, and I would uh, definitely like to tell everyone and, and anyone to read Bob's work and find out about what he's been uh, writing and teaching for going, I guess it's going on 50 years that he's been working in ecology. Fantastic. Yeah, really a lot of this uh, whole approach has come from him. He wrote a book called A Third Window, Natural Life Beyond Newton and Darwin. Um, and in that he, he talks about a lot of these same issues, the critique of mechanistic science, why uh, ecosystems show us a different reality. Um, so he's been my, my greatest teacher. Could you introduce us? Sure. Yeah, I could do that. That would be great. Dan, it's been such a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you for coming on the show. Thanks very much for the opportunity and for your whole uh, Planet Critical series of uh, podcasts. They're really great. Thank you. I'm so pleased you think so. If you want to learn more about Dan's work, I've put links to his book in the description box below. Remember to subscribe to this channel and share the episode if you enjoyed it. If you loved it, support Planet Critical on Patreon, where you can find bonus episodes of my thoughts on each interview. A huge thank you to the Planet Critical supporters. This work wouldn't be possible without you. Thank you all for listening, and I'll see you next week.